Hello everyone, N3FJZ here. Okay, um, I haven't posted anything on my front panel for my SSB transceiver, only because I've been basically goofing off doing some other stuff, and I shouldn't, I should be working on the front panel. But anyway, uh, today I'm surrounded by old stuff. Okay, what you see here is a project I started in 1997. So it would be uh, something like 24, 25 years ago. And this was supposed to be a handheld instrument for uh, checking some equipment I was responsible for at my uh, place of employment. Uh, but never did finish it, and it was just an idea I was playing around with, so I, I constructed this board which is a Z80 microprocessor based uh, motherboard, I guess you could say. Um, it's a Z80, has RAM and ROM, some input, and there was another board that would have contained a keyboard and some other I.O., LCD display and so forth. And it would have been powered by two 9-volt batteries. And on it I have a switching regulator <clears throat> instead of using a linear 5 volt regulator. I have a switching regulator which would be very efficient for the use of uh, 9 volt batteries because this was supposed to be a portable field instrument. Well anyway, um, got involved in some other things and I put this thing in storage back in 97 or so and uh, <clears throat> moved on to other stuff. But recently I've been uh, looking at uh, doing microprocessor work based on stumbling across a couple YouTube videos so apparently it's a it's a uh, it's a popular thing to uh, build up Z80 based circuits and so I started rummaging through my storage area and found some stuff and um, what we have here is a uh, is an EEPROM emulator and what I had also built for it was a uh, circuit card or interface card that would have gone into an IBM XT and I wrote an assembly language program that would allow me to um, transfer the contents of a um, Intel hex format hex file over to the um, target board. So this, what you see here, these two devices I guess would be equivalent to sort of like an Arduino type development environment where you would, uh, in this case I would be using an assembler, assemble the, uh, the program, dump it to a hex file, and then uh, transfer that hex file to this pod which contained a uh, 32k static RAM and of course then you plug a uh, a cable onto your target system which would emulate the EEPROM. Uh, so, well the problem was the interface board um, it wouldn't, I can't use it with modern equipment because the new Windows and other systems well I didn't, I wanted to use it with the IBM compatible machine uh, because that's the software I had written for in an assembly language. Unfortunately the newer machines uh, this, the interface plugs on the bus are not the same. Also, even if you could plug it in, uh, the assembly language program that did the transfer was running in DOS with DOS calls and it needed direct access to the hardware which is no longer allowed through modern operating systems. So what I did was I took an Arduino Nano and wrote some really, really hacked up some code just to be able to um, transfer a file over to the unit. So anyway, I may have something on that later, but what, uh, what I'm doing here is I finally got this thing to work. An interesting story was back in 97 when I designed this thing, and of course back then, and even today to some extent, let me get this board here out. some light on it here. Yeah. 
all my schematics were done hand drawn on paper. If I can get back a little bit here. And um, the yellow is a highlighter. As I wired the board up, I would cross out the various uh, lines to say that I've soldered those in place. Anyway, here's the interesting part of this whole story. As you can see here, in my original design, I had gotten the uh, pin numbers for this RAM ROM select chip swapped. And that's the way I wired it with the error. Never did power the board up, never did do anything with it, so I never Back then, I didn't realize there was an error, and I just put everything away. Well, recently, I've been playing with this thing, and for the life of me, I could not get it to work. It was really flaky. It was doing weird stuff. And um, the problem was, I had that error, so essentially, it couldn't read or write from RAM. So I did a couple quick tests, and, you know, if I use registers, I could do things, but as soon as an interrupt were, were called, or was called, uh, since RAM wasn't available, it couldn't do the stacks so the thing would crash, so I couldn't understand what was going on. Uh, so, long story short, found the error through troubleshooting and uh, made the correction, and now the board's working. And here you see this little auxiliary board. I have a latch here. And uh, it's just flashing the LED, and up here on the scope, uh, the, uh, the top line is the, uh, the clock signal to that latch, and the bottom line is the data line. And you can see where it's latching in the data when it flashes on and off. Also, the way I would write, in addition to the schematics being and this was a, a compiled on an Apple II computer using a cross assembler. And what I would do is uh, I would need to write a routine, so I would sit down with um, this piece of paper and I would write out what the routine needed to do. Made up a little programming model here showing what different flags and things. Let's see, this was done in 1986. Write up a little something on it, and here I got additional information on the uh, programming model. And then the next step would be to actually write the code. So I would hand write it out from the from a flowchart. So um, in my style of writing software at that point, you really couldn't sit down and write from the hip. At least I couldn't. I'd actually have to do all this preliminary work first draw up a flow chart on what was going on, write in all the different uh, steps involved, and then you can see at some of the junctions I got a point two, a point three, a point four, and assembly language is very close to the flow chart itself. It's almost a one-to-one -one translation, and I would just write it out. And then the last step was to uh, type it into the compiler and compile it, and then use the uh, pod here to uh, transfer it over to the board. So I just thought you'd be interested in seeing that. Um, I don't have anything up on my site detail-wise, and that's you know I, it would be um, maybe something I'll do in the future here. But there's a lot of other sites that do much better justification on on Z80 based stuff. But uh, it was really uh, unnerving at first because you know, I haven't done assembly language in many years and this thing was in storage for so long. And I'm looking, you know, it's like, did I forget how to do it? I mean, am I not getting this? I'm looking at the instructions and it's like, well, it's all the right instructions and the thing just would not work. I mean, it would work briefly until an interrupt occurred and everything would just kind of go off into the weeds. So, just wanted to uh, get that to work there. Okay, and uh, all right, uh, have a little bit more on this later, perhaps.
and this was my way of assembling things back then. And here's the other side of the board. What's using wire wrapped wire, but it's this it's a what I call a modified wire wrap technique where um I'd use wire wrap wire, but instead of wire wrap sockets, it's use standard sockets. Wrap the wire around it. And just solder the wire on. And back here, right there. Let me see, I can't see that. All right, okay. Here's the chip that had the problem. So what I had to do is pins two and three, I had those swapped. So I had to dig in there and swap those wires back around. Also, I don't yet have my bypass capacitors for the power rail. And let me show you an example of that. Okay. Here's, um, here's a board I built for a project that uh, it's a, it was a similar product. Matter of fact, it was the, the precursor to the project, this one here. Matter of fact, it got to the point where I didn't go far enough to even name it, so I just called it Project 97. But anyway, this was the precursor instrument. It was a lot larger. It was not really handheld, even though it was a portable device. And this design used uh, four phase lock loops and some dividers and things. I had to generate long-term pulses for measurement equipment. So you needed like eight pulses a minute or something along those lines or seven pulses an hour. So you could actually type in the different pulse rates per minute and then set both the number of pulses and the number of minutes per period and so forth. And I came up with a better method of doing it. So this board came out and the new board went in. But the reason I'm showing you this one is the um, the way I do the bypass capacitors over each chip. And you see I just run it from rail to rail. Over each uh, integrated circuit right at the power point. And I see a lot of designs on the internet with digital circuits and things and I'll, some of them, a lot of them, they'll, they'll breadboard it and they won't have bypass capacitors and that in the very early days in 1981 or 82 when I started doing digital circuits and things I didn't know about the concept of bypass capacitors across the power rail and I had a lot of circuits that were just flaky, they would work sometimes, they would fail other times and it's absolutely essential to have bypass capacitors. In this case, you can see it's a, uh, a 0.1 microfarad or 100 nanofarad uh, capacitor across each power rail. And this is the way I would do it. A microprocessor bus, bus came in on this connector and all that those wires then would then distribute through the rest of the board Well, anyway, I hope you enjoyed this. Like I said, it's not my, one of my normal projects where I have a lot of documentation up there, but I may, I may have a, may develop a section, like I could really have, if I had more time, I probably could do it. But it's the idea of, um, let me see if I can pull the schematic up here. Okay, and here is uh, that same paper copy I showed you. Uh, I've transferred it over to a uh, to a file here, and right there is where the error was, which I've corrected here. It was the RAM ROM select chip. 
I had A and B swapped, so needless to say, RAM was never selected. And now it's working. <clears throat> anyway. Power this guy back up for whatever reason. It wouldn't work at first, and we reset it. Okay, there we go. Flashing again. Well, 7-3, everyone. N3, FJZ.